First, it would be important to at least test this idea out in two dimensions, or possibly three dimensions. The physics of electromagnetic wave propagation is unique in one dimension, and sometimes we can get results that are not reproducible in two and three dimensions. So we would at least want to create a two-dimensional model of this system. If we implemented a three-dimensional model, we could take into account both the finite size of the body in 3D and we could model the physical dimensions of the antenna, meaning we could model a more realistic source antenna and we could optimize the antenna. Another thing we should do is optimize the source waveform and probably also collaborate with signal processing experts in order to optimize our ability to detect the body. Something else we should study is how other objects or features might impact our ability to detect a person. For example, what if trees are caught up in the avalanche and there are then trees and other debris mixed up in the snow with the body? Or in areas where there are glaciers, the glaciers can have air crevices which can also introduce additional reflections. After improving our model, we can also think about physically testing the system. To physically test the system, one option is to put the radar system and the antennas on a sled which can then be pulled by hand or behind a snowmobile. Here are some pictures from a group that built such a radar system in the early 2000s. In this case, the sled is carrying the antennas, a pulse generator, the receiver electronics, a power supply, and a portable laptop for displaying the results. The group that built this system is at the University Center of Svalbard. Svalbard is an archipelago that is part of Norway. The biggest settl settlement on Svalbard archipelago is Longyearbyen. Longyearbyen has about 1,500 inhabitants. Here is a nice picture of Longyearbyen. You can see the archipelago located here, which is just north of Norway. And the location of Longyearbyen is given by this arrow and, and dot here on the archipelago. On February 4th, 2001, two people traveling on snowmobiles between two settlements on Svalbard were reported missing just south of Longyearbyen, the settlement. Due to a lack of witnesses, winter darkness, and bad weather conditions, it wasn't until February 5th that search and rescue located an area with snow snowmobile tracks going into an avalanche area but not coming out of it. This avalanche occurred on the east slope of the mountain Habergnuden, which is about 10 kilometers south of Longyearbyen. The avalanche deposited snow about 8 meters thick and in an area that is more than a thousand meters long and 100 to 200 meters wide. Since about 24 hours had already passed, at the very beginning of the search, it was clear that it would not be possible to find any avalanche survivors. So the primary mission of the radar system was to test the system and shorten the rescue operation. Here is an example result from the tests. In this figure, we can see the surface of the ground, which is right here, and the original snow cover, as well as the avalanche deposits. We can distinguish between the two layers of snow because the electrical characteristics of the snow for the original snow cover versus the avalanche deposits are different. Since this was an early test of a radar system for detecting people, they took the time to dig caves at different depths in the snowpack and put volunteers inside of those caves in order to test how easy it would be to detect the presence of a person in the snow. This figure shows the result for an area that has an empty cave that the volunteers dug. So this is where the cave is located. They're calling it a cavity. And here is the ground surface or rock surface. Here's the result for the same cave or cavity, but with a volunteer inside of it. There's a clear difference in the radar image when there is a person in the cavity versus no person as on the previous slide. Using the results of the tests with volunteers, the group was able to find the avalanche victim at a depth of three and a half meters, as you can see in this image. So here is the missing person. These early tests were time consuming. 
The sled was heavy and had to be pulled around by hand. The results were analyzed manually, and it took eight hours for the group to locate the missing person. Another issue with this early methodology that the Norwegian group used is that it is often dangerous to search for avalanche victims on foot or using snowmobiles because there could be a risk of more avalanches in the area. Here is a brief history of using ground penetrating radar for detecting avalanche victims, GPR. GPR has been considered for detecting avalanche victims since about 1980. Since 2005, researchers have considered airborne platforms for finding victims. Helicopters at first and um, drones would be another good candidate. Since 2008, a group developed a continuous wave radar system. It worked at 2.4 gigahertz to detect the vital signs of people buried in the snow. For example, uh, breathing and a heartbeat. And then in 2009, or since 2009, automatic algorithms have been developed to speed up the time-consuming process of manually evaluating the data that is received. However, despite all these advancements, today there is still no widespread use of GPR for finding avalanche victims. Further work is needed to demonstrate the effectiveness of this technology in a wide variety of scenarios. As on-the-fly computing capabilities, signal an analysis methods, and equipment continue to improve, it seems more likely that an effective solution could be developed. Maybe you could put together a team to develop a robust system? At any rate, we've reached the end of the first design challenge for this class. Next time we will start a new design challenge, but before I finish today's lecture, I want to mention something. You've probably figured out that the method that we have been using so far to solve Maxwell's equations is called the Finite Difference Time Domain Method, or FDTD for short. FGTD was first introduced by Kane Yi back in 1966. An interesting story about FGTD, the original paper that Kane Yi wrote on FGTD became what is called a dead paper, meaning the research community ignored it for several years after it was published. At that time, everyone was working in the frequency domain measurement equipment, analytical calculations, and numerical methods were all focused on obtaining the sinusoidal steady-state solutions to Maxwell's equations. My former PhD advisor, Professor Alan Tafloff, who was at Northwestern University at the time, came across Kane Yee's paper while he was a PhD student. He found it as he was looking through journal papers at the library, back when you had to physically go to a library to look through published papers. At the time, he thought the method showed a lot of promise, even though Kane Yee's paper had zero citations. And Professor Tafloff was fortunate enough that his thesis advisor allowed him to work on further developing the method. Ultimately, Professor Tafloff gave the name, gave the method the name FDTD in 1971. And in the decades since, he has written a large number of journal papers and books on FDTD. This, of course, is perhaps a good example to all of us that sometimes it takes a while for things to catch on or for our hard work to be noticed or for others to adopt promising technologies. Today, FDTD has become one of the most popular ways of solving Maxwell's equations, not only because it is very effective for many scenarios, but also because it is fairly simple to learn and use, at least in comparison to other numerical methods for solving Maxwell's equations. In fact, the FDTD method has become so popular, popular that there are now hundreds of commercial solvers that use the FDTD method. Here are a few examples. This means that you don't always have to write your own codes from scratch, but hopefully after this course, you'll at least know how these so-called black box commercial codes work if you ever use them. By the way, many employers are looking for students with FDTD modeling experience. One of my graduate students just had an interview for an FDTD-related internship at Apple, for example, and some of the former postdocs and PhD students from my lab now work at Apple or Intel Corporation or Air Force Research Labs, Raytheon, Nanometrics, which is a semiconductor industry company located in California, and Comsol Inc., for example. So after taking this class, I encourage you to list on your resume that you have experience in writing your own FTTD codes. You may be surprised at which employers are interested in this skill.